to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. And we're delighted to welcome back Dr. Smith to the Institute and for the first time in Loudoun County. On Holy Spirit, amen. Our Heavenly Fathers, we gather in this Church of St. John. We're grateful for all the many gifts that you pour out to us each and every day. Uh, tonight, we thank you, Lord, for the Institute of Catholic Culture, for all, that, um, all the generous gifts that are poured out each week uh, and many nights a week at the Institute. And we pray for its continued uh, success and prosperity for the sake of the kingdom. But tonight, Lord, we pray especially for those Christians who, whose hearts are breaking and really for all people who are in any way connected to uh, the Holy Land. We pray that you would bring uh, work uh, works of mir- miraculous grace and healing and reconciliation and peace as we all pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Luke the Evangelist, pray for us. And St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. And the patron saint of the Holy Land, St. George, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you. And thank you for having me back tonight. I would, I've actually been pretty busy with the Institute. Um, about, uh, actually, it was Tuesday night, I finished up a presentation on the temple um, called The Liturgy of Creation. Uh, we looked at Genesis 1 and 2. You know, how many of you were at uh, those talks? Yeah, we had a great time. I actually had a temple with me, a three dimensional temple that I built for, um, for fun uh, with my daughter and brought that with. I don't have a temple with me tonight. I do have some of my. Uh, teaching resources. One of my passions is trying to help ordinary Catholics who can't, don't have time because they're busy working in their busy lives and families uh, to learn. And so I love coming to events like this. And I also do, for about three or four years, and I've been doing recordings of really my courses. And so I'll tell you later about some of what I have. I've got a course in the rosary and a bunch of other good stuff in Scripture. But let's get to it. Tonight we've got um, a great topic. It's called jo- uh, Joseph, Joshua, and Jesus. And the subtitle is The Mystery of Biblical Typology and Recapitulation. And that's a mouthful, right? What is that all about? I know those are pretty big words on a Sunday evening when we're just trying to wind down from probably lots of things going on, and this sounds pretty heavy-duty, but I want to assure you um, that I think you'll get a lot out of tonight. We're going to do a little bit of character study on two great characters of the Bible, Joseph and also Joshua. But truth be told... This is not really going to be as much a major portraiture of either of those two characters. As much as what I want to do is teach you how to read the New Testament in light of the Old and how to plumb the depths of the Old Testament. And one of the things we're going to look at is called typology. It may be familiar to some of you. The other one is probably going to be new to a lot of you. But once we're done talking about it, I think you're going to really... Um, enjoy it, and you'll be able to use it in your own Bible study. So let's get started. At the top of the page, I always like to begin with the thesis. Where are we going tonight? So here it is. Tonight we'll explore a key principle of Catholic Scripture study, of how the New Testament is hidden, lies hidden in the Old, and the Old is unveiled or revealed in the New. Reading in this way, reading typologically, was how the apostles proclaimed Christ and how many early church fathers explained the scriptures to the early church. Now, going beyond typology, which I said some of you may be familiar with on some level, although I'm going to define it for you in just a minute here, we're going to learn about a remarkable tool for our scripture study that's called recapitulation. And once you grasp how those two things work, typology and recapitulation, we're going to try to apply those to the figures of, of Joseph and also Joshua to see how they point forward to our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? All right, point number two, first major point, biblical typology and recapitulation explained. Let's take all the guesswork out of this and define what these two things are, both of which are mentioned in our catechism. 
So I'm going to start with some definition uh, from the Catholic Bible Dictionary. It's a great resource, by the way, uh, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Hahn, was the major person behind that. Every Catholic should have a Catholic Bible Dictionary. I recommend the one called the Catholic Bible Dictionary. And he defines typology this way. It's the study of persons, places, events, and institutions in the Bible that foreshadow later and greater realities made known by God. So in a sense, typology means that when you're looking at certain figures in the Old Testament, whether it's Joseph or Joshua or even the temple or many of the things, the bronze serpent right, from the story in Numbers, all of these can be things that point forward to the New Testament. The way I like to explain typology to my seminarians is, uh, imagine standing in front of a mirror, right? If you stand of a full-length mirror, right? And you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see an image or reflection of yourself. That's kind of typology. It's sort of like a mirror, right? Except you have to imagine that the one that comes first, that is in the Old Testament, is really the mirror, and the one that it foreshadows in the New Testament is the reality, the actual person, place, or thing. It's not to say that what's in the Old isn't real, but it's to say that what comes in the New Testament is even greater, right? So uh, Moses is sometimes called a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, because in various ways he prefigures, he he mirror, he's like a mere reflection of him in the Old Testament. Here is a definition from, I think, one of the greatest biblical scholars, Catholic biblical scholars of the last century. His name is Jean Cardinal Donnelly. He was made a cardinal um, just in the very latter years of his life, and a great mind. He says this, that the realities of the Old Testament are figures of those of the new is one of the principles of biblical theology. The science of these, what he calls similitudes, between the te- two testaments, old and new, is called typology. So he's going, I think, even further and saying, this is just a cornerstone of how we look at the Old and the New Testament. Right? Now, before we go any further, it might be helpful to clarify or dis- to distinguish between something else called allegory. This is, I get asked this all the time. Is typology allegory? And the answer to the question is, not so much. Uh, There is some similarities between them, but let's talk about what's distinct. Okay, typology always involves real persons, real places, real institutions, real things. Moses, the temple, and so on and so forth, right? Allegory allegory has no such limitations. Um, So allegory is reading a biblical text figuratively, often involving metaphor. Um, It was an approach, uh, allegorical approaches were very popular in the early church, in both the West and the East, but particularly in Eastern figures. The great origin, uh, St. John Chrysostom and others, really used this to plumb the depths of the spiritual meaning of Scripture. And the footnote, and I won't make my way through this, but footnote three, I have, even St. Augustine did some allegorical interpretation. So he took the Good Samaritan story, and he just went to town on it. For him, every one of the uh, points in that story pointed to something else symbolically. Um, So the Good Samaritan was Christ himself, The inn uh, that the Good Samaritan takes the man to is the church, and St. Paul is the innkeeper, like that. So he just kind of didn't stop, right? But that's kind of the idea and difference between typology and allegory. Allegory doesn't have to necessarily be about, could be fictional, could be more symbolic. Typology involves actual realities, okay? Turn the page if you would. It always helps, I think, to have a couple of examples. So let's look at a couple really famous ones. I think the most famous one Uh, is probably the one I'm going to read in just a moment. And it's on the lips of Jesus himself. So let's look at it. Um, In John 3, John chapter 3, Jesus says in his speech with Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, what he's referring to is a famous story in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, let's right above it, let's read that, where it says, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, what had happened is, you know, the wilderness time was a time of hardship for the Israelites. It really, truly was. And in this particular occasion, many of them were dying because of fiery serpents or poisonous snakes that were in the wilderness. And Moses, once again, steps in um, and saves the day, and he makes a bronze serpent and puts it up 
on a pole at the Lord's command. And God tells Moses, tell the Israelites, whoever looks at that will be spared. It's kind of like putting the blood on the doorpost. It was a sign of faith, right? But maybe you're asking the question, well, why would our Lord compare himself, the Son of Man, to a serpent? Isn't that kind of a weird comparison? So sometimes typology can get a little bit strange because it just sounds odd. Like, why would he choose that example? But if you think about it for a moment, it actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because what happened when Moses lifted up that bronze serpent? Forget about what it is, right? This image of a serpent. But what happened when the people looked at it? They were healed. They lived. And then you click it into place and you go, oh, I got it, right? He's saying whoever looks up at the Son of Man when he's lifted up on the cross is saved. So sometimes you have to kind of let go and just let let the typology kind of guide you forward. And it gets really, really exciting. Here's another example. Uh, This one involves a baptism. And uh, here, St. Peter uh, writes this, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And actually, the word that St. Peter uses, where it says corresponds, um, is the word tupos, T-U-P-O-S, tupos in Greek, which is where we get our word type, like, in, like a type, a typology, a, a, a signal, a symbol. Okay? So Peter himself drawing on the example of the Old Testament where Noah and his family were saved through the water. So he's basically saying, um, in this case, that act of God saving Noah and his family through the waters prefigured the waters of baptism. We're saved through the waters of baptism. And he's drawing on that Old Testament example to make a case. So both Jesus himself and St. Peter and many of the other writers of the New Testament drew upon these Old Testament persons, places, and things to teach, to show show how Jesus uh, in some ways reflected those things but also surpassed them, right? No one's saying Jesus is a serpent. No one is saying that, you know, the ark is equal to, you know, something in the New Testament like that. It's the idea that it points forward. It's like a big neon sign that points forward, right? And these New Testament writers really, truly believed that God had planted these mysteries in the Old Testament so they would be like a time bomb going off, right, in the time of Jesus and the apostles, okay? Now, let's get a little bit more clarity on it from the Catechism. Next point on the page, page two, a little clarity from the Catechism on biblical typology. Um, The first thing is the Catechism teaches us that it's all about prefigurement, prefigurement, says the church as early as the apostolic times and then constantly in her tradition has illuminated the unity of the divine plan of the two testaments through typology, which discerns in God's works of the old covenant what it calls prefigurations of what he accomplished in the fullness of time in the person of his incarnate son. So kind of like that idea I said a moment ago, it's the idea of kind of like a mirror that points forward to from the reflection to the reality, from the shadow to the reality. It also says this, Christians read the Old Testament in the light of Christ crucified and risen. That is how we read the Old Testament. Now some of you I know have tried reading plans of the Bible. And you start in Genesis, and it's really exciting because, you know, you got temples and all this kind of a temple of creation. you got Adam and Eve and the garden. and Then you move into Exodus, and that's also exciting, the Red Sea and the manna and all that stuff. And then the last part of Exodus gets pretty rough because it's 15 chapters of tough going as God gives the instructions for the tabernacle. And you're like, well, hang on for the next book. Maybe it'll get a little bit more exciting. And you're smack and dab in the middle of Leviticus. And you're like, maybe I need to rethink this Bible reading plan after all, right? Let me go to the Psalms or something fun, right? Um, but what I would suggest is certainly reading the Bible through is, uh, is a virtuous discipline. It's well worth it, even when it's tough. Um, but I think what the Catechism is saying is one of the ways we're called to read the Old Testament is to read it and to look for the figure of Christ in the Old Testament, Right? Now, the Catechism also gives a little caution here. Before we rush to a judgment, it says this. uh, Such typological reading discloses the inexhaustible content of the Old, but, but we must never forget that the Old Testament retains its intrinsic value as revelation, reaffirmed by the Lord himself. What's it saying there? I think it's telling us 
don't make the Old Testament um, simply proof texts. And that sometimes troubles me when I hear Christians, especially Catholics, doing this. What do I mean by proof text? Anybody know what a proof text is? It's taking a verse or two, maybe three, out of uh, the Bible and using it to make a theological point, right? The problem with that um, is sometimes, unless we have the entire context, we can be led astray. I'll, t- I'll give you an example of this. I was in Jerusalem uh, uh, two years ago, and I was in uh, the lobby of our hotel. We're going off to the Golgotha, to the Holy Sepulcher, and there was this fundamentalist Christian guy there. And he was basically kind of interrogating our, our Catholic seminarians, making sure that they were, in fact, going to heaven, right? Asking them, are they saved, and all this kind of, are you born again, and all this kind of thing. And so I walked downstairs, and there's like 10 guys there, and all of a sudden they look at me like, well, he's our professor, just talk to him. So they, uh, they all, they, they threw me under the bus. They did, they threw me under the bus. But if you have a Bible, open it up tonight. I want to show you what, just what he did with me and how I uh, tried to show him what he was doing was proof texting. Open up to Romans 10, if you would. This is just a, a little quick side trip, but it'll be fun and quick, I promise you. Romans 10. And so I got to talking to this guy, very nice, very passionate about Scripture. But he gave this, me the same thing. He said, how would you like to do a little Bible study on Romans with me? I said, well, I only got a minute because we're going down to the Holy Sepulchre, but sure, tell me what you want to tell me and then we'll talk about it. So he said, well, I just want to ask you this question and, and see if you think this uh, applies to you. I said, okay, so he read it. And he said, Romans 10, uh, beginning in verse 9. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so he, a- he asked me right there in the hotel lobby, he said, have you done this? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that uh, God raised him from the dead? I said, I try to do that every morning, one way or another, you know, when I go to Mass or just pray. He said, but yeah, was there one moment in time when you did it? I said, well, that's, that's kind of an interesting question. Why do you ask that? Why, why does it matter one moment in time? He said, because there comes a point in everyone's life when they go from eternal damnation to being justified, right? And he said, this is exactly what Paul wants you to do. He said, you could do this tonight and become saved. You could become a Christian tonight. I said, okay, um, can I give you my perspective on what's going on in this, in this passage? And he said, sure. And I said, I don't think that Paul is really teaching how one gets saved at all. I said, I think he's teaching who can be saved. He said, no, 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 that's not what it's about. I said, okay, we can debate it. But I said, well, you just read the next couple of verses for me. And he did. And here's what it says. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Now he's going, yeah, preach it, Paul. I said, now read the next verse for me. Just finish the paragraph. And here's what it says. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. Everyone who calls upon the Lord will be saved. And um, believe it or not, he actually gave me two or three minutes to explain. And I took my chance. And I explained kind of what was going on in the Church of Rome. And I won't do that here with you tonight. But basically how Paul had a very complicated problem of bringing together Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians into one functioning unified church. And that passage, he's really basically talking about how both Jews and Gentiles can all receive salvation. Neither is exempt. They all can call upon the name of the Lord. I said, but that's really about who can be saved, not how to get saved. I said, see, so you're kind of distorting what's really going on there. It's not a formula for how to, you know, like Billy Graham, pray the sinner's prayer and become a born-again Christian. It's just talking about that the gospel message is limitless. It applies to Jews and Gentiles and to everybody, right? And we, you know, had to agree to disagree, and we left it there. And I went on to the Holy Sepulchre, and he harangued some other people, I suppose. But, um, but my point is, I think that that man, I think, from my point of view, was guilty of proof texting. Uh, he already had in mind what he wanted to do, and then he went and found a Bible. He was like, you hunt for a Bible verse that sounds like a corresponds to what you want, and then you just, right? But that's not what the catechism is saying. It's saying the Old Testament retains its reality, right? It retains what it is. It is revelation. We have to be careful not to simply get excited about typology and rip it out of its context. So you have to kind of do this with some prudence. Okay. Um, and it's all about towards fulfillment in, in Christ, right? It's all about Jesus. So point number three, typology indicates the dynamic movement toward the fulfillment of the divine plan. It's talking here about Jesus, right? When God will be all 
in all, or everything to everyone, as Paul says. Okay? The, the, the calling of the patriarchs and the exodus from Egypt do not lose their own value in God's plan from the mere, mere fact that there were intermediate stages. The catechism always wants us to respect and appreciate the Old Testament, even though it points to things that are greater. Okay? Now, let me go back to this guy, Jean Donalou. Um, I want to bring in a few quotes from him that I hope will help just you absorb this kind of very uh, fascinating topic of typology. So let's look at a few quotes from him. This is from a book, two books. One book's called The Bible and the Liturgy, which I think is one of the best books uh, on um, a sacramental understanding of Scripture, and also a book called From Shadow to Reality, Studies in Typology. Let's look, look at these. Okay, he says, The New Testament did not invent typology, but simply showed that it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And the church as well. So in other words, typology is not limited to, uh, to Jesus. In fact, there are types of Mary in the Old Testament. I would argue that Hannah, the mother of Samuel, is a type of, of a prefigurement of Mary. Uh, Moses, as I said, is a prefigurement of Jesus Christ. Uh, there are a lot of ways that the Old Testament foreshadows the New. But then he says this. The New Testament had no need to devise a typology of paradise in Adam. It was there already. Right? It's very simple, right? It was there already. The first paradise was a type of the one which God had laid up for his people at the end of the world. What's he comparing there? He's talking about the Garden of Eden, which some of us talked about on Tuesday night, right? And the book of Revelation, which talks about the new Eden, which is our heavenly home. So again, he's pointing to how these mysteries are really um, all over the place in the Old Testament. <coughs> also the sacraments. Not only Jesus, but the sacraments. Here's what he says. The Gospel of John shows us that the manna was a prefigurement or figure of the Eucharist. This means that the sacraments carry on in their midst, in our midst, what he calls the mirabilia, the great works of God in the Old and the New Testament. Next page, if you would. Okay, so that's about as far as I can carry it. A basic understanding of typology. Everybody okay so far? Good. All right. Now, this next concept goes a little bit further. If you like typology, you're going to love recapitulation because it's very similar. But if I can dare say, I think it's even more exciting than typology. Um, Here's what it's really about. And this comes from the Catechism. What was lost in Adam is recovered in Christ. Those are just my words. That's typology in a nutshell. What was lost in Adam is recovered in Christ. Let's take a look at what the Catechism says. Christ's entire life is a mystery of recapitulation. I'm going to teach you the Greek word here in a moment. Let's read on. All Jesus did, said, and suffered had for its aim restoring fallen man to his original vocation. When Christ became incarnate and was made man, he recapitulated in himself the long history of mankind and procured for us a shortcut to salvation so that what we had lost in Adam, that is being made in the image and likeness of God, we might recover in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. For this reason... Christ experienced all the stages of life, thereby giving communion to God, to all men. Now, the Greek word um, that, uh, from where we got our word recapitulation, is a little bit of a tough one, but it's fun to say. I'll say it, and then you say it with me. Anakephaliosis. Who's he? What's it? What? <laughs> Anakephaliosis. Very good, right? Kephale in Greek means uh, head, person's head. So anakephaliosis kind of means to put under the headings, that is to say, like to reorder something, like if you're Excel spreadsheet, you know, kind of like that, right? To reorder something. Um, capitulare means something similar, it's to kind of order, to bring order to something. So it's about how everything that was lost in Adam is being recovered and perfected and restored in Jesus Christ. Now, maybe the questions come up for you, well, isn't that like typology or how are these similar or different? So just like I did with the allegory, let's try to clear the air here and make sure we understand the difference between recapitulation and typology. Here it is. Recapitulation is similar to typology, but recapitulation is a mystery that goes beyond types and antitypes. Typology is about the figure of Jesus, the person of Jesus, or Mary or the church, right? Recapitulation is about the acting Christ, who restores and perfects history. Here's what I mean by that. 
Typology is really satisfied that you would see something here in the old and something here in the new and that there's kind of a connected dash line between the two, like a mirror. Recapitulation is like typology on steroids or three-dimensional. It's looking out in all directions. It's looking through the book of Genesis. It's looking through Exodus. It's seeing how Christ in many ways restores what was lost in Adam and perfects it. And basically what the catechism says, this is what gets me excited in the morning teaching my seminarians, is that no matter where you look in the Gospels, Jesus Christ is perfecting something of creation in himself. When he does a miracle story, right, he's, re, he's, he's recapitulating creation, which is broken. Paul says that all the creation is groaning, waiting for the coming of the Lord, right? When Jesus Christ does a miracle story, uh, when we see, read a miracle story of Jesus Christ, it's not just the raising of Lazarus, the healing of the woman who had the, uh, the hemorrhaging for many, many years. He's showing us what the new creation looks like in himself. When he casts out a demon, right? He's not just showing that he's triumphant over evil, right? And Satan and death. He's giving us a foretaste of what heaven will be like. He's showing us what the perfected creation looks like in himself that was lost because of sin. So, Typology is enough to see the figure, the person standing there, just the person saying, oh, see that? That is to this. Recapitulation, it's he's moving, he's acting, he's healing, he's dying on the cross, he's raising from the dead, he's teaching, right? And it gets very three-dimensional very, very quickly. Now, St. Paul actually used the word anakephaleosis. It's used once in the New Testament. Here it is. In Ephesians, he says, For God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite, or to sum up, right, he's using that word, uh, anakophilosis, in him, to sum all things up in himself, things in heaven and things on earth. St. Hilary says something very, very similar when he says, Christ begets the church, cleanses it, sanctifies it, calls it, chooses it, redeems it by true prefigurations through the whole course of the world's history, in the sleep, and then he gives these examples, in the sleep of Adam, in the flood of Noah, the blessing of Melchizedek, the justification of Abraham. So when St. Hilary looks at the Old Testament, he just sees Christ everywhere. And when he sees Jesus doing things in the New Testament, he sees him doing things symbolically in Jesus' own historic reality to perfect and recall and renew the whole of creation. So why did Jesus Jesus choose 12 apostles? Well, we all know the answer, because there were 12 tribes of Israel. But you apply this through the lens of recapitulation, it gets much more dynamic than that, right? It's like he's renewing all of Israel, drawing it together, uniting it in himself. That's recapitulation. Now, Donalu had a lot to tell us about typology. He also says a lot about this one, so let's read what he says. Christ both accomplishes and restores what had been done by Adam... This is the exact meaning of recapitulation. We are concerned with a new beginning, which is a resumption of the first, while at the same time it both restores the broken harmony, and he says here we have the idea of reparation of sin, and also surpasses the original work. To think of the universe as, for example, St. Irenaeus does, who considers it an altogether unique plan as composed of two successive stages— this is the very essence of recapitulation. So he brings in Irenaeus here, and I would say the greatest figure in the second century as far as biblical theology is probably St. Irenaeus, in, in my view. And Irenaeus, this is just how he thought. In fact, um, Bishop Robert Barron uh, wrote an article about the biblical theology of Irenaeus, and he says, in one word, it's recapitulation. And the following that I'm going to read you is from Bishop Barron, uh, Father Barron, Bishop Barron, And I think it's the best definition I've heard of for recapitulation. Here's what he says. Jesus is in person the recapitulation of time and history. The notion of anacaphaleosis, rendered in Latin as recapitulatio, recapitulation, is the master idea of Irenaeus' biblical theology. And here's the great sentence. He says, Jesus draws all the strands of history and revelation together in himself, preserving and repeating them even as he brings them to fulfillment or perfection. Thus, he's the new Adam, the one who participates fully in the reality of Adam, including physicality and alienation from God. You're thinking about Adam, right? Even as he draws all that was implicit and potential in Adam to completion. 
you see how recapitulation is further than typology? Typology is like, see this? Here it is over here. Recapitulation is about how Jesus transforms, sanctifies, renews, and goes far beyond, right? All these is all that was potential in Adam. Jesus is doing things that Adam, in his fullness, never even experienced, right? He's the true Adam. He's the true David. He's the true Moses. It's not just that Jesus is, we're reminded of Jesus in these figures, right? It's as if he's repeating their stories, but as he repeats them, he's healing and surpassing them to teach us about our own destinies. And Bishop Barron, someone no less than Barron says, the recapitulating Christ is the interpretive key of the entire Bible. In other words, for him, that's what it's all about. Now, that brings us to a turning point. To this point tonight, we've talked about what these two things are, but now let's try to apply them to Joseph, and time permitting, we'll look at Joshua, right? But there's a lot here, so if we don't make it through Joshua, you have the notes, let's at least start with the figure of Joseph. A little bit of biography on Joseph, we all know who he is, right? He's the 11th son of Jacob, and his life is the focus of really about 10 or 12 chapters of Scripture, Genesis 37, almost to the end of the book. And um, if you look at the book of Acts, this is on page 4, it gives a nice summary of his life. It says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom uh, before the king of Egypt, who made him governor over Egypt. This is in the book of Acts. So it's recalling the story of Joseph, right? And then it talks about how all that was fine, but then there came into Egypt a pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And then, dum 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 right? Things got really deadly and very, very badly. Um, okay, so there's that little summary of Joseph's life. And maybe the best verse to summarize up his life, a lot of you have heard, right? Uh, near the end of the book of Genesis, this is point four. Um, once he was cast out, right, by his brothers, sold into slavery, but then he redeems his brothers and those relationship with his brothers. And here's what he says about that. This is Joseph, right? As for you, meaning his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Remember when Joseph goes down into Egypt, things are bad, right? He's, he's sold down into slavery, but he works his way up into Pharaoh's court and he ends up actually many, in many ways uh, doing a lot of good, bringing the people to a place of survival, right? Not just survival, but prosperity. They grow, they multiply. Okay, so let's take what we learned from typology, look at a few examples. I don't think I'll get through all these because I, I got about 12 of them on here for you. But there's a lot of typology to look at with Joseph. Here's, let's look at a few. Joseph is the beloved son. In Genesis, we read, Now Israel, that is to say Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other children. Shame on him, right? Every mother says, right? But the Bible's reporting this. I'm only just reporting what the Bible says, right? Uh, but you can see examples of this in the New Testament, right? Where God the Father says, This is my beloved son, in him I'm well pleased at Jesus' baptism, right? Or again in John 1. What about their journey, right? We, know, we just learned that Joseph goes down to Egypt, right? Joseph was taken down to Egypt. Joseph went over the land of Egypt, uh, sold into Egypt, right? Various places in Genesis. And of course, look at Jesus' story. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Now, I don't think it was lost on uh, Matthew that uh, Mary's husband was name was Joseph, right? And that they're commanded by an angel in a dream, just like Joseph had dreams, to flee, right, from Herod and go down into Egypt. He actually goes further and says, look at the next page, St. Matthew, this was to fulfill what God had spoken through the prophet, Hosea, out of Egypt I have called my son. So for Matthew, it's like, of course he had to go to Egypt. It wasn't just because of Pharaoh, but he's repeating the story of what happened in the Old Testament. What about rejection? We know Jesus is rejected, right? So was Joseph. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Right? Look how John begins his gospel. He came to his own, and his own people received him not. Or in Mark's gospel, right in the middle of it, right? 
it talks about how he would be rejected by no less than the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and they sought to kill him. Um, Temptation. Joseph faced temptation, right? Genesis 39, the story of how he flees from Potiphar's wife, right? And you have a story of the temptation of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1 and the other Gospels, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. It's with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Even the robe. We all know about the famous robe of Joseph, right? Genesis 37, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Now, look at the story of Jesus Christ. They stripped him and put his, a scarlet robe upon him. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus was cast into, into a pit, but every year when I go to Jerusalem, I take my seminarians to the house of Caiaphas, and according to tradition in some early church um, writings, Jesus was placed in a pit in that very place. There was a conspiracy to kill Joseph. Um, they saw Joseph afar off, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him, right? Mark 14, chief priests and scribes, we're seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. So you start adding up the stories and you see a lot of similitude, as Jean Donald would put it. How about one more? Sold for a small amount of silver. Did you know that? Genesis 37, the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and they lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And compare that with Matthew chapter 26 and Judas, right? who goes to the chief priest and says, what will you give me if I deliver him? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, right? Now, it's not exact there, but that's not the point, right? It's just the comparison. So there's a quote at the bottom of the page and some others here from St. Ambrose you can take a look at on your own later because the point is that I think this was already clear to the gospel writers. And the, the two examples I give you here from a figure whose name is um, Quadvolt de- Deus and also St. Ambrose are just two of many. I had actually notes with about 15 quotes of the Church Fathers I had to remove from the outline, or Monica would have killed me. But the point is there are many, many, many more here. I think you can see clearly that there is a kind of typology, right? But now, let's talk about recapitulation in Joseph and see what we can learn here. Page 6. Typologically, Joseph certainly prefigures Jesus, yes? I don't think any doubt about it. The first is the shadow. The second, Jesus, is the reality. Yet, is there more to the matter? Well, recapitulation would say yes. Now, recapitulation involves this kind of prefiguring, right? Like a mirror. But at the same time, we saw that it goes further. So the way to get at this, I think, is to ask a question. Because it's about how Jesus brings the Old Testament part forward in a way that perfects it. So here's the way we'd ask the question. What, according to the Gospels, does Jesus repeat about Joseph? Here's the key. In a perfecting way. Because all we've heard so far is that Joseph is just the cat's meow, right? And the question that recapitulation would ask is, well, look at it a little bit more deeply. On a human level, what was there in Joseph that was, you might say, imperfect, broken, fallen, that Jesus recapitulated, right? Because if it wasn't, you know that old saying, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? But there's something broken in creation and in all humanity. And that's the figure of Christ as he goes back to that mystery and he lifts it up and perfects it. So what was there to perfect in Joseph? Let's take a look. This is a quote from Genesis 47. Why don't you read with me very carefully here? Very interesting quote about Joseph. Here's what it says. Now there was no food in the land so that the land of Egypt languished by reason of the famine. That's why they're there, right? Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought all the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt, um, in all the land of Canaan, uh, lost my place here, Um, And when the money was spent in the land of Egypt, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. Joseph answered, Give your cattle, and I will give you food in exchange for your cattle if your money is gone. So they brought the cattle to Joseph. Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, the asses, and he supplied them with food. 
Okay, that year goes by. Now, they came from the following year. This is going on for years here, right? And they said to Joseph, there's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. You ain't got nothing left, Joseph, so we can't, you know, what are you going to do now? Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, and the land may not be desolate. So Joseph brought all the land, bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, and all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe upon them. The land became Pharaoh's, and as for the people, he made slaves of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Did you know that about Joseph? Now, here's what's interesting. Let me bring in a, a Jewish scholar from the University of Chicago. His name is Leon Cass. He's actually a physicist. Uh, he was under George W. Bush on uh, Pres- President Bush's uh, advisory council. Very respected guy. But he actually wrote a book on Genesis, a brilliant book called The Beginning of Wisdom. And he persuasively argues that Joseph is a kind of anti-hero and a foil for Moses. He says, Genesis starkly uh, juxtaposes Pharaoh's extraordinary generous welcome to the Israelite strangers with Joseph's extraordinarily ungenerous, not to say harsh, treatment of his own native Egyptians. To be sure, everything Joseph does, he does not for his own gain, but for Pharaoh's benefit. The money, the land, the people themselves, the text repeatedly tells us, all wind up in Pharaoh's hands. Now here's the good news and the bad. The good news is that the time of Joseph's lifetime, the Pharaoh was very good and he was very generous. He was very fair. So when Joseph brought everything into his hands, the people under him did okay. Let's read on. Cass says, I'm inclined to see Joseph's failings as emblematic of what he calls an administrative soul. That's what he says Joseph had an administrator's soul, and the Egyptian way in which the morally blind penchant for technical mastery over things and events logically implies the emergence of despotism and servitude. Wow. So Cass, he's kind of reading through the story carefully here, says this, Joseph out Pharaoh's Pharaoh, acting towards Pharaoh's people as the later tyrannical Pharaoh, the one who knew Joseph not, right? The one that we meet later in the story, the bad Pharaoh, Ramses, will act towards Joseph's people and not incidentally towards the Egyptians. So the later Pharaoh appropriates all the land, the livestock, centralizes ownership, institutes feudalism, enslaves the entire population, and in his cruelest move, destroys the farmers' attachment to their lands by uprooting them, removing them to cities. Remember, they have to go and build bricks and all that? In some, Cass says, Joseph acts to establish Pharaoh as the sole and supreme master of everything. To exaggerate but slightly, it is Joseph who introduces absolute lordship into Egypt. So which is he, good guy or bad guy? Let's read on. Cass also says, Joseph is shrewd about things, he's very blunt here, right, but dumb about the human heart. He can serve a master but cannot lead men. He can preserve a life but only by destroying a way of life to its perverse conclusion. Land, patrimony, freedom are sacrificed for the goal of survival. As a result of Joseph's doings, Egypt comes fully into its own. Now here's some interesting proof, positive, that I think Cass is right. At the end of Genesis, it seems to reinforce Joseph's Egyptian heart. When he dies, he dies alone. There's no mourning for him, no state funeral, and get this, instead of being buried, Joseph's body was placed in what's called an aron, that is to say a coffin or ark. His body is placed in an ark, the same word that will later be used for the repository of the Mosaic law, same word that's used. Coincidence? I don't know. Joseph is embalmed and resting in an ark is the alternative to and foil to for the Torah resting in the Ark of the Covenant. He's an image of it, but in reverse, right? Not only that, get this. Joseph dies in Egypt at age 110. It's the end of Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. So big deal, right? People lived a long time in the Bible. But that was, historians tell us, the ideal Egyptian age. Even if a, a person didn't live to be that long, lived to be not, they would just round it up to 110. It's true. A not-so-subtle critique, I would argue, of, of Joseph. Because remember, he's a, 
son of Jacob, right? Joseph is not buried, which was, by the way, the Jewish way of death. You're buried, not embalmed. That's the Egyptian way, right? Had a chance a few years ago, in 2009 now, to go to Egypt and see some of those uh, coffins of the, of the so-called pharaohs and the mummies and so on. Uh, and it really is quite striking and beautiful, but it's a very stark contrast between the uh, Judeo-Christian way of burial, right? Here's what Cass says about it. Once again, very helpful. He says, burial accepts that we are dust to dust. The way of Israel is memory. Keeping alive not the bodies of the dead, but their ever-living legacy to an ever-living God. Finally, the last word in Genesis, the very last word, is in Egypt. The first words, Barashit Elohim, of Genesis, in the beginning God, the last words, Bamitzraim, Egypt, in Egypt. Cass concludes, Joseph is in all respects a dead end. Tell us how you really feel about Joseph, why don't you, Leon Cass? But see, he's trying to bring out, he's trying to bring out the other side here to the story. We don't often hear, as for many of our kids, as we learn in Sunday school, he's sort of the, he's the superhero, right? I don't think he's trying to diminish him. He's simply reading the biblical text through and saying there's more to the story here. In many ways, he is a good guy. But we have to also be honest and assess the character honestly and say, but did he do these things and how did it turn out? Well, I think there's, you know, something to say on both sides. Jesus Christ, then, is the true Joseph. Jesus says, truly, I truly, I say to you, no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come eternal life. In other words, yes, we can see typology of Joseph and Jesus in many ways, how they coincide, yes? Yes. But when you read in terms of recapitulation, it's not so much that you're trying to bring the Old Testament character down. You're just honestly assessing and saying, how does Jesus surpass this? Well, I would say it this way, because Jesus Christ is not inviting us into a kingdom that's on this earth alone, right? We're not invited into simply in Egypt, right? We're invited into the kingdom of God. Now, Joseph did the best that he could. I'm sure in his mind and with his heart, he poured out all his energies to try to bring about the best good. No doubt about that. But at the same time, we see how our Lord is the true Joseph, right? Who meets us on our own sojourn, right? And has a greater good than we can possibly imagine. And Jesus will never take us to a place, unlike Joseph, who doesn't know that he's doing harm, right? Probably. But what does he say to the apostles? In my Father's house are many mansions. We can trust Jesus' word that what he says he will do. Some of these events were beyond Joseph's control. I argue that, right? No, no question about it. He did the best he could. Jesus Christ invites us into the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. These are all great promises, but are they simply promises, right? Jesus was not a technocrat, right? He was the divine son of God. What this means for us is we can see a shadow of Jesus Christ in the figure of Joseph, who who was a great leader, right? Who had to act as best as he could in a very tough situation. But what he was able to do is broker and negotiate with forces that became more powerful than himself. What about Jesus? Did he ever deal with forces more powerful than himself? Well, in a human level, it certainly looked like it, right? Well, what does he say to Pilate? I have the power to lay my life down and to take it up again. So in that way, he surpasses, right? Surpasses the figure of Joseph. What about Philippians 2? Where Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. There is nothing of the administrator's soul, right, in Jesus, as there was, according to Cass, in Joseph. That is to say, did Joseph get caught up in the moment of trying to negotiate with his pal, Pharaoh, who he thought was a good guy? Maybe, right? We can trust Jesus' vision. I don't know about Joseph, right? I don't know about me. I don't know about you. But we can trust our Lord all the way through. He was the divine servant leader. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So there's much we can learn from the figure of Joseph, right, as a type of Christ. At the same time, when you read read in terms of recapitulation, the question is, how does Jesus heal and perfect and restore that which goes far beyond this great figure of Joseph? And if he could do that for the Israelites, what can he do for me? What can he do for you? What can he do for the church today? Now, because of time, we can't go through, I don't think, Joshua in the same depth, but let me try to sketch out just a couple of things here. Joshua, of course, is another type of Christ in the Old Testament. He's the successor to Moses. He becomes the prime minister of Moses. We actually first meet him in the book of Exodus. And, of course, he's the courageous spy who goes and spies out the land, right? Under Moses' command, go and spy out the land across the Jordan, see what's there. He goes with Caleb. And a report comes back, and the report is basically, it's pretty bad. We're going to get annihilated. Let's just turn back. That's the majority report. But the minority report, thanks be to God, came in from Caleb and Joshua that said, no, God is on our side, and if God is for us, who can be against us, right? So he's the faithful, courageous spy. He's the successor to to Moses, and he finishes the job. Remember, Moses, the great leader that he was, ends up dying in the lands of Moab, and the mountains of Moab never makes it into um, the promised land. I would argue, if you want to know the answer to that question, people say, well, why did that happen to Moses? That seems so harsh of God. Um, Moses had to sacrifice and lay down his life for his people. That's what he was called to do at each step. Right? From the time God called him as a simple shepherder. Right? And Moses did that faithfully to the end. Right? He did not get to see what Joshua saw. Right? And then as I gave you a great verse with jo- uh, Joseph, here's a great verse from Joshua on page 9. Right? He's challenging the people to commit to the covenant, and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose your gods, right? I've already made my choice. My choice is to serve the Lord God. Now, again, typology, just to tick these off a little bit more quickly, to start with his namesake. I mean, hello. (laughs) The name Joshua means the Lord saves. In Hebrew, say it with me, Yehoshua. Yehoshua, right? Yeshua is Jesus' name in Hebrew. They're virtually synonymous, right? The Lord saves. Actually, translate uh, Joshua into Greek, and you get Jesus, Jesus. This did not take very long for the church fathers, and even before them, the evangelists, to figure out that there's a kind of typology here between right, the deliverer of the Israelites and the deliverer of humanity, Jesus Christ. Here's what St. John Chrysostom says. The name of Joshua is a type. For this reason, then, because of the very name, the creation reverenced him, Jesus. The man was on account so called as a type, for he used to be called Hosea, right? That was his name originally. Moses renames him. Therefore, the name was changed, for it was a prediction and prophecy. He brought into the people of the promised land the law, since neither Moses but remained outside. Ah, he's also trying to make us help make sense of why Moses was outside the promised land, right? He's looking at. At that typologically, too. The law has not power to bring in, but grace does. So basically, typology then becomes an argument to do something else, which is to, homil- to make a homiletic about how um, Jesus brings grace. Right? It's not law, but grace. Another one there from Tertullian you can take a look at, uh, where he compares entering the promised land to entering the heavenly Jerusalem. Right? Um, he says, Therefore, the great man who was ordained as a type of this mystery was actually consecrated with the figure of the Lord's own name being called Joshua. Uh, The 12 stones that Joshua sets up, Gregory of Nyssa compares to the 12 disciples. Um, Another fascinating one from the Venerable Bede is about the manna. By the way, when did the manna cease? They remember the manna flowing down from heaven each day. When did it stop? Didn't continue always. When did it stop? When When they came to the promised land. And the manna was actually described in Exodus as wafers that had the taste of honey. Wafers of bread that tasted like honey. Why honey? Because when they ate it, they were reminded of that land of flowing with milk and honey that they had not yet seen. And in that sense, it reminds us who partake of the Eucharist, right, that when will the new manna cease, so to speak, right? In the new promised land, in the, in the new Jerusalem, right? There's something greater that awaits us than 
our Eucharistic Lord, as odd as that is to say, right? It's the Lord himself, the lamb that was is slain as though, standing as though slain, right? Now, um, recapitulation, just quickly. Um, you can see all sorts of types. In fact, a lot of the church fathers said that Rahab was a type of the church. Why? Because what does Rahab do? She hides the spies, right? And a lot of the church fathers would say, well, Rahab kind of is a prefigurement of the church because the church hides the innocent, protects them, right? What about recapitulation here? Okay, last page. Um, like typology, the mystery of recapitulation involves prefigurement, foreshadowing. Yet recapitulation, as we learn, goes further. So here's the question. According to the New Testament, does, what does Jesus Christ do in a perfecting way according to Joshua? I think the answer is this, right? Jesus Christ is our conquering king, but not in a way that Joshua conquered. Now, Joshua was called to make war. There's no doubt about it, right? To go and eviscerate the enemies, right? But what we have to understand is our Lord Jesus Christ is not simply a reflection of that. He surpasses it. Because what Joshua was called to do and did involve bloodshed, involved a kind of a war of the natural order, right? With those of Jericho and other peoples. The war that Jesus Christ fights is greater in that it involves sin and death. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we live in the world, St. Paul says, we are not carrying on a worldly war. I wonder if he had in mind there some of the wars that Israel had gone through even under Joshua, right? For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments, Paul says, with every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is incomplete. Look at Matthew at the, at the, in, right after the crucifixion of our Lord. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep were raised. In other words, Matthew's telling us that the war that Jesus was involved in had a cosmological nature. It wasn't that he was just marching around the walls of Jericho and bringing them down. That was spectacular. But what Jesus did was spectacular on an infinite level, right? What about Colossians? Paul says this, For in Christ the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to the fullness of life in him. In other words, Joshua does, like Joseph, point forward to Jesus Christ. But both of these great figures, right, we can see a comparison, we can also see a contrast. Typology more or less looks at the contrast, how these figures have much to teach us, but about how Jesus Christ far surpasses them. I'll leave you with this last thought. Um, You may have seen in the news uh, all the violence that's going on in the Holy Land, and Nablus, which is a city in uh, the center of uh, Samaria, and Jesus' day has been uh, the scene this week of recent violence. And the tomb that was recently destroyed there was none less than the tomb of Joseph that we're just talking about. Fortunately, the Palestinian police stepped in, they put the fire up, but the tomb was badly damaged. Um, That's something we need to pray about. But think about this figure of Joseph, right? What's the difference between the tomb of Joseph and the tomb of Jesus Christ? The tomb of Joseph was desecrated this week. I can't say that the tomb of Christ was never desecrated. It has been. I've been at the place where it was desecrated many, many times. If you've been to Golgotha, that was torn down and rebuilt many, many times in this very place. There is a difference between the tomb of Joseph and Jesus, and it's this. Both men went into that grave dead. One man came out alive. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our God and Father, we thank you for teaching us some of the mysteries between the Old and New Testament. We thank you, Lord, for always being faithful to your word to teach us. Help us to embrace these mysteries of how the Old and New Testament function together and give us um, constant grace, constant nourishment as we pray together the words that the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Amen. Holy Joseph and Holy Joshua, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks again, Dr. S Dr. Smith, really. It's been edifying. And, and, you know, my question is, for those of us that are catechists, um, and, and mind you, I think we all can admit that we didn't grow up with the Bible um, in terms of a Bible study the way um, our separated brethren do. Um, we get our Bible in the church um, during the liturgy. But when we, we teach Bible study and, and the Catholic faith to our, our young ones, um, my question is, should we, and if so, how can we use recapitulation to help these, these kids understand the wealth and the majesty of the Bible and how the old and new fit together? And th the image that came to my mind was little kids with transformers. Do you know what they are? You know, um, the recapitulation, you know, Joseph, Joshua, and then there's Jesus transformed. Or like a puzzle, G Jesus, the tree of life, the cross, but somehow or other it broke and it's scattered into all these pieces. And Jesus came along and put the puzzle back together and fused it. But, you know, how do you teach recapitulation? I just don't want them growing up the way I did, you know, and with nothing. I mean, and loving the, the Word of God, that's, that's my, how do I teach them to love the Word of God like you're teaching us tonight? Uh, well, before I just take that question, thank you for sticking around for it. My wife said, wear something Halloween-y, so this is the best I can do here on short notice. Uh, we're out at picking our pumpkins earlier, now I'm wearing one. Um, get to your question in just a second. Oh, I forgot to mention at the end, so please forgive me if I take a moment and say, um, I brought with um, some of my resources. One way, I hope, is to keep coming to stuff like this. Keep coming to the Institute, which I keep saying every time I'm blessed to be here, this is... Um, in all my travel across the United States, this is, I think, one of the finest, if not the finest, uh, catechetical um, formation for adults, it really, certainly on the East Coast. So number one, I mean, just keep coming and absorbing uh, what you get here. Um, I would also say that um, when I train um, seminarians, I go through, there's a chapter in my book, A Recapitulation. Some of them have actually gone out and tried to do this in what's called their pastoral field education, where they're dealing with kids in, say, eighth grade or high school, and sometimes it goes successfully, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it does because the guys are pretty good at trying to speak on their level. So the main thing is, if you, some of you are catechists, as I'm sure you already know, don't need me to tell you, that the most important thing is to love them and to connect with them on a human level. Uh, a lot of our guys that go out, they're always so anxious to try to teach faithfully, teach the orthodox faith, and um, sometimes they come home feeling that they didn't quite hit it out of the ballpark. And I always say, look, if you get on base, that's great. But more importantly than how far you take a concept, I think, is making that connection. Some of them will come back and tell me stories uh, so sad of families that are broken. And sometimes these kids, uh, how much it touches their lives to see a seminarian or just a person who loves them so much. Um, just a real, if I can tell you a quick story. We do something called Mount 2000 every year which is a Eucharistic Congress and Conference for a weekend for high school teens. And one of the guys came up and told me that, I think it was two years ago, he was with a small group of teens, and, um, and then the last time it came up, so a year later, a kid saw him in a hallway, came running up to him, gave him a big hug, and he said, I was embarrassed. I didn't even remember who the kid was. It took me a couple minutes to kind of get his name and figure it out. But he said, that just goes to show you how sometimes those people that you sometimes you don't think have any particular connection with, or it's a small contact or just a smile, can go a long, long way. And so my, my biggest admonition is just when you have opportunities to share about your faith, the most important thing is is just to be yourself and to be loving and to be kind. Very quickly, on recapitulation, it is in the Catechism in paragraph 518, and so you can look it up. And it's actually mentioned with two other um, concepts called revelation and redemption. I call them the three R's. I talk about them in my book. Actually, when you put those three together, it's an incredible concoction. And um, I've, I've got a series. Uh, I didn't bring it up here. It's called um, The God Who Speaks, and I go through, I give about 10 examples of how these work. In the, in the Gospels. One summer, I actually took the catechism's advice and went through the entire Gospel of John looking for recapitulation and re revelation and redemption, the others that are mentioned, and I found them in nearly every paragraph, which is to say the catechism doesn't say things lightly. You can really put a lot of confidence in what the catechism says, and if you follow it, it can really change your Bible study, but good question. Um, I'm interested in the tomb of Joseph. They saved it, evidently. Uh, it, it, well, what would they... 
attackers have against Joseph. He didn't do anything to them. Uh, that gets into more a political question. The short answer is, is, I don't know if it's so much Joseph, but it's, a, it's an icon of Judaism, right? And so I think that, the, again, we need to pray for, for peace and understanding because sometimes you'd say, why would you do that? But it's, uh, it's one, just one of the tragedies that's going on in the Holy Land. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.